So, you've got another Marvel movie for me? Yes, sir, I do. Coming up with original ideas for a series with over 20 movies in it has got to be getting difficult. Actually, it's super easy. Barely an inconvenience. Oh, really? Well, you remember how with Star Wars we ripped off Avengers Endgame? Boy, do I. On your left. But there are more of us, Poe. I am Iron Man. And I am all the Jedi. <laughs> <sighs> Making money off the same ideas in different movies in the exact same year is tight. Glad you think so, sir. Because because that's exactly what I'd like to do to kick off this next phase of Marvel. Oh, really? Well, you know how we killed off Han Solo and then inexplicably made a movie about his backstory like a year later? You mean Solo, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I was thinking of doing that exact same thing with the MCU, but this time with Black Widow. Ah, it sure is easy to be creatively bankrupt when you make all the movies. It certainly is, sir. But wait a minute. Wasn't Solo a huge flop? Whoopsie. Whoopsie. <laughs> internet, welcome to Film Theory, the show that has cancelled all of its red carpet premieres for the foreseeable future. Honestly, those were a huge expense for a YouTube channel anyway, and maybe we should have quit them earlier, but you know, home popped popcorn just isn't the same. I am going through butter flavor substitute withdrawals here, people. Speaking of which, appreciate this video, friends, since it's likely the only Marvel content that you'll be getting for the better part of this year. The events of 2020 have resulted in a lot of massive societal shifts, but one of the most interesting to think about has been the absolute shattering of the Marvel movie cycle that we've been on for nearly a decade now. One movie at the beginning of the year and one at the end. Sometimes if they were feeling ambitious, they'd throw one into the summer months too. It was nice. It was just part of the routine, like the changing of the seasons. You had the changing of superhero posters at your local AMC theater. April showers bring May flowers. May Star-Lord brings July Spider-Man. It gave you something to look forward to, but now because of world circumstances, the house of cards that is the Marvel Cinematic Universe has started to tumble, and making it even worse at a time when it was already at its most vulnerable. I mean, 2020 was already going to be a stressful year for the MCU. You're coming off the conclusion of the biggest cinematic story arc in history, a crossover of epic proportions with fan favorites leaving and roles being passed to a whole new generation of faces. That's already a pretty big shift. Now you have to get people on board for the next big thing to come, so that's challenge one. Challenge two, your house of cards suddenly has expanded into much more content. You're no longer just asking audiences to invest in two or maybe three movies a year, but now there's also Disney Plus streaming shows that we have to watch. Oof. Okay, I already had a subscription to watch Lizzie McGuire, so I guess I'll fit in WandaVision. And do I have to watch Falcon and the Winter Soldier? I gotta be honest, I'm not particularly interested in that one. Maybe we should start calling this the Marvel Connected Universe, just to keep that same MCU acronym, because cinematic just isn't accurate anymore. Will this newer, bigger universe collapse before it even gets started? At least they have this new phase being kicked off by their biggest stars, Spider-Man Far From Home and the Guardians of the- Oh, wait, that's right. Right. A long time ago, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 was scheduled to release in 2020 as the second part of Phase 4. Smart move! Get some of the most beloved characters to lay the groundwork for all the new adventures set to come. Spider-Man on Earth and the Guardians up in space. But in 2018, the series' director James Gunn was fired off the project, only to be rehired a year later, but at that point the damage was done. Guardians was pushed back to 2022, leaving the big Welcome to Phase 4 banner being hung on none other than Black Widow. A film that was already on the bubble of being direct to streaming, starring a character who died in the last movie. Not a great plan. Chalk all that up to challenges three and four. And now everything has been pushed back with Black Widow coming out in November, with a domino effect to every other release date. I mean, I was just eager to get through the 2020 movies and back to the Thors and Doctor Stranges that I love at the top of 2021, but nope, gotta wait a whole nother year for those guys. And that is challenge number five. So after years of dominating the box office and tons of smooth sailing, the Disney Marvel machine already had itself some rough waters ahead, and now they're even rougher, with Black Widow as the figurehead at the front of the ship. And all of this is without me even mentioning the intricately crafted story arcs between franchises where characters are introduced, twists happen, and those ripple effects are felt through the next wave of content, all of which is dependent on perfectly timed releases. Of course, that last point wouldn't matter all that much if Black Widow were really just an after 
the fact phase 3 movie that most people think it is, but I don't think that's the case. The more I see of the Black Widow trailers, the less I think this is gonna be an empty filler movie in the release slate. Despite the world expecting Disney to just drop Black Widow onto Disney+, Plus, like Onward, or just follow the home premiere trend that a lot of other movie studios are using these days, Disney didn't do that. And beyond financials and contracts and things, I think there's a reason for that. A solid narrative reason that affects the entirety of Phase 4 movies. I think that they pushed back the releases of two years worth of productions so Black Widow would get a chance in theaters because Black Widow is gonna be as important to establishing Phase 4 of the MCU as Iron Man was to establishing Phase 1. Because, get this, I think they may be setting this whole thing up for the next generation of Avengers. A new team of evil Avengers, known as the Dark Avengers. Let's look at the facts. I've already spent some time in a previous theory talking about how the Black Widow trailers may have already hinted at the true nature of Taskmaster. That the he is actually a she, Melina Vostokov, coming from the same training program as Black Widow, only with a chip on her shoulder because Natasha Romanoff is so much better at everything, and also left the rest of the girls trapped in that awful program. Melina gets herself injected with the super soldier serum and comes back to kill the friend who left her and the rest of the Widow family. Cool, that's all well and good, but Taskmaster, as I see him or her, is just our villain of the week in this case. Kind of like Ant-Man 2's Ghost or Iron Man 2's Whiplash. She may come back here or there, but she's not the overarching threat for the entirety of Phase 4. But there is another, much more sinister and further reaching villain marching across this movie, General Thunderbolt Ross. Now, many have forgotten by this point, but Ross is actually one of the earliest characters introduced into this whole universe, with his first appearance happening way back in the second MCU movie ever, 2008's oft-forgotten Incredible Hulk. Here you have an unusual problem. You should talk. You should listen. What if I told you we were putting a team together? Who's we? Forgotten for good reason, too. Twitter was buzzing the other day about Iron Man 3 being the worst Marvel movie. Get serious, guys. Have you watched Incredible Hulk? I mean, look at those CGI abs. I've seen more realistic looking stomach muscles on a PlayStation era Tekken character. Now, in that movie, General Ross was the bad guy, hunting down the Hulk. But since then, he's been more or less a neutral force in the films, acting as US Secretary of State with his biggest act coming in the form of the Sokovia Accords from Civil War. For the past four years, you've operated with unlimited power and no supervision. That's an arrangement the governments of the world can no longer tolerate. But I think we have a solution, the Sokovia Accords. But there's a lot more to this character than meets the eye. His sinister nature has always dwelled just below the surface, and in 2008, Marvel Comics transformed Ross from a mortal military leader into something a lot more fearsome, the Red Hulk, an uninhibited, tactically intelligent adversary for our lovable green guy. In the comic storyline, he was created as part of yet another super soldier program led, in part, by the criminal organization known as Intelligentsia. Now, here's where things get interesting. You see, while the Intelligentsia and its core members have yet to appear in the MCU, one of its key allies and partners for creating the Red Hulk has appeared in the MCU. Advanced Idea Mechanics, or AIM for short. I have a proposal I'm putting together myself. It's a privately funded think tank called Advanced Idea Mechanics mechanics, or AIM for short. You see, in Iron Man 3, while everyone was busy complaining about the Mandarin, AIM was working in the background pulling the strings. They created the Extremist program, which made super soldiers in possession of heat-based abilities. You breathe fire? Okay. Now, Red Hulk doesn't exactly work the same way Green Hulk does. When Red Hulk gets angry, instead of getting stronger, he gets hotter. Wait a minute. Didn't we just say that AIM was making heat-based super soldiers in Iron Man 3? And we know that in Black Widow, Ross is going to be playing a big part, and that the plot will have to do, at least in part, with the return of the Super Soldier Serum. So now, if only we could confirm that AIM was going to be a part of this movie, we'd have ourselves a pretty strong case for Red Hulk appearing sometime before the end of the film. And would you look at that? AIM is going to be making an appearance in Black Widow. See, if you freeze frame and look at the medical equipment at the bottom of the screen, you can clearly see A-I-M marked on the side. So we have the man who will become Red Hulk, the project that made the Red Hulk, and the return of the MCU's evil scientist organization known for making heat-based soldiers, all combined into this one movie. Seems like it's more than just a coincidence. Now, all that alone would be noteworthy, but that scene with Yelena on the gurney is interesting for another reason. Not only does it introduce AIM back into the MCU, but it also reflects a plot from the 
comics with some bizarre implications. If you look closely at that freeze frame, you'll notice that Yelena Belova's face has a neat little seam running along the top. Nope, that's not her hairline, and it's not a wig that's been snatched. You see, the Marvel Breakdown comics involve Natasha getting facial surgery to look just like Yelena. She does this to convince Yelena that super spydom is dangerous, which, you know, you don't need facial swap surgery to really do, it's called watching any Jason Bourne movie ever. Anyway, if this scene is real and not just manufactured for the trailer, it looks like the MCU might be trying to follow in the comic's footsteps, with Yelena posing as Natasha, or Natasha posing as Yelena, one of the two. Again, I don't know why you need to take it that far, considering that in Winter Soldier, Natasha had herself some pretty convincing facial disguise technology, but again, super spies gotta be super. But here's the twist, my friends. What if the facial swap doesn't end with this movie? So, Yelena and Natasha swap identities, or faces, or whatever. Maybe Natasha is trapped in prison or something, and Yelena is going out posing as her. Big whoop, right? Think again. Remember how in Infinity War and Endgame, Black Widow's hair was blonde, rather than the usual red? The change was never explained in continuity. The characters definitely had bigger issues to deal with than Natasha's choice of hair color, but it was kind of strange to see this famously red-headed character just go blonde for a movie and a half for no reason. We all just dismissed it as a way to mix up the look of her character, keep her identity hidden while she's a fugitive from the government, or heck, just sell more Black Widow toys. Now with blonde hair action! But what if the blonde hair was an indicator that this isn't the real Black Widow, the one that we know and love and continue to question why she belongs in a team full of gods and tech billionaires. Now, hair alone wouldn't be all that much evidence, but what about the vest? We see it in the trailers for Black Widow. Yelena is wearing a tactical vest, no sleeves, two snaps along the neck, three double bracketed straps that wrap around the body, all worn in a half zip. It is the exact same vest that we see Natasha, or Natasha, wearing in Infinity War during the subway fight scene to protect Vision. A tactical vest, no sleeves, two snaps along the neck, three double bracketed straps that wrap around the body, all worn in a half zip. Originally I thought that Marvel Studios was going to do exactly what Marvel Comics attempted in 2002, replacing Natasha Romanoff with Yelena Belova as the new Black Widow. That year, Marvel released an entire year's worth of Black Widow comics without Natasha, but that wasn't a super popular decision. After a year's hiatus, the Black Widow comic returned with Natasha. Natasha back in the main role, and Yelena cast as a villain moving forward. And that may just be our biggest clue as to Yelena's real purpose in the MCU. Between Ross's involvement in the movie, and Yelena's likely impersonation of Natasha, I believe Yelena is gonna become the first member of MCU's Thunderbolts, eventually leading to the reveal of a new team of villains, the Dark Avengers. Let's start with the Thunderbolts. This is a weird little Marvel team that has wildly varied members depending on what version it is, but the general idea is that Thunderbolts look like superheroes on the surface, but are more of supervillains in disguise. Or superheroes being misled by a supervillain. Red Hulk ran a Thunderbolts team consisting of heroes like the Punisher, who eventually turned on him when he realized that Ross was up to no good and wiped out almost the entire team. Other notable leaders of the Thunderbolts include Baron Helmet Zemo and Norman Osborn. Both of these figures are upcoming in the MCU. Baron Zemo was already in Civil War, and we know that he's making a return in Falcon and the Winter Soldier. We also also know that a twist in Black Widow will be important for Falcon and the Winter Soldier, so the connections there just continue to deepen. All of it is a major indicator that the Thunderbolts are going to be playing a large role moving forward, and Yelena could serve as a perfect member of that almost hero supervillain team. As for Norman, well, he's already been hinted at in Spider-Man Far From Home, as we covered in a previous theory. So if Norman Osborn does indeed join the Thunderbolt crew, well, it'll give Marvel the chance to upgrade the Thunderbolts to the Dark Avengers. It's exactly what Norman Osborn did in the comics. He joined the group, he took it over, and then he made them into the Dark Avengers. And think about it, we may already be on our way there. An evil Hulk and an evil Black Widow. Things are definitely starting to take shape. And heck, we all know that the most exciting storylines are when the heroes end up fighting themselves. I mean, that's what the Power Rangers taught me. So there you have it, friends, why Black Widow may be more worth our time than anyone expected and why Disney really wants to make sure it releases in theaters. Now, the biggest obstacle standing in the hero's way isn't Taskmaster or Thunderbolt Ross or even the Dark Avengers. It's just an enemy that's too small and too difficult for any of them to overcome. Now it's just a waiting game for the real world heroes to save the day so we can finally get back to watching the fictional ones on screen. But hey, that's just a theory. A film theory. And cuts.